this is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. The BBC Wartime Broadcasting Service, known as the WTBS, is a little-known piece of Cold War history which would have been for many the last human voice they heard after a nuclear attack on the UK. Ian started working for the BBC in 1988 and due to the pressure on training space, he was trained in a nuclear bunker at BBC Wood Norton. After training, he went to Broadcasting House in the UK where he first encountered some of the technical infrastructure the WTBS would use. Ian did a spell in the main control room and recalls the red phone which was the link from Whitehall to initiate the BBC War Book. Over time, Ian has collected knowledge on all aspects of the WTBS and Ian shares details of where it would have been broadcast from and what would have been heard and who in the event of an attack would have descended into the bunkers to broadcast. Ian also delivers talks on the subject and there's a link in the episode notes to get in contact with him. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. This is Mary O'Grady. Anyone who's interested in Cold War history should definitely subscribe and support Cold War Conversations. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Ian Betson to our Cold War Conversation. This is the Wartime Broadcasting Service. This country has been attacked with nuclear weapons. Communications have been severely disrupted, and the number of casualties and the extent of the damage are not yet known. The Cold War Wartime Broadcasting Service was a uh, a BBC-delivered, but would have been government-directed radio service that would have potentially been the last voice you ever would have heard. It would have uh, been... Uh, broadcast at set periods in its last reiteration set periods and set times in the day uh, to inform and hopefully update survivors of a nuclear attack on the UK of uh, what they should do to survive. What triggered your fascination with the WTBS as we will call it from now on otherwise half the podcast will be us pronouncing the subject name. (laughs) There's another uh, quick initial we need to use as well and that's DF, Deferred Facilities as well but I'll come on to that. And if uh, two acronyms is not enough for you you've also got one more which is RSG which is Regional Seat of Government. Uh, What triggered my interest? Uh, 18th of January 1988, I joined the BBC as a studio support engineer, and we were the people who actually fixed the equipment in the radio studios uh, for the BBC. Uh, I didn't actually do any sort of fader pushing or anything like that. Uh, So 18th of January, I joined the BBC, and my first day was at a place called Wood Norton near Evesham in the UK, in the Midlands, just south of Birmingham. And it is or uh, was uh, when I was there, or been has been massively slimmed down now. Was the engineering training department, and that's where they trained anybody technical at the BBC. So that whether that's people like me, the maintenance people, and people who were doing a similar job in television, uh, through to cameramen, vision mixers, sound operators, all those people were trained at um, ETD Wood Norton, and. When I was there, 1988, they had a shortage of classroom space to teach us. And one of the places that they used was this bunker. And uh, it thought, oh, we, we all thought, oh, this is an interesting place. And we were never given the free run of the place. But we went down one, one floor into a wide open uh, uh, area that was clearly a sort of flexible area that could be used for production purposes or, or, or briefings or meetings. And we had lessons there. So this was quite intriguing. I then do my training for a six-week course, and then I get sent to Broadcasting House in London. 
And uh, one of the sort of tours of the various areas they worked you through was the main control room. And this is where all the studio feeds for BBC Radio come into the control room and then they are distributed out to the transmitter networks and uh, and the various other broadcast platforms that BBC had. Uh, it's run by a man called a technical operations manager, a Tom, and he has an assistant, an Atom. And on his desk was a red phone. And I thought, this is very interesting. Uh, what's the red phone? And I was told that was the war phone. And then, well, this is more interesting things. Um, time moves on, and I uh, move to local radio as a local radio engineer. And I first encountered the DF, Deferred Facilities. And these were known as DF lines, lines that ran between various BBC uh, premises and transmitter sites that were clearly not regular broadcast lines. Um, And sometimes, about once a month, I'd be rung up and uh, we've got to do a DF lines test. And a voice would say, please do this, please do that. They would never tell you, which is the normal thing, how... where, you, where they're calling from, you meet, normally you'd have a conversation with the other person doing the lines test, making sure it all sounds okay. It wouldn't be drawn on that at all. I tried to as I was doing these tests as time went on. No, nope, they wouldn't say anything at all. A bit later on, I was um, had to go up to the Warborne transmitter site, which is a very big transmitter site near Peterborough in the Midlands, on one Sunday night, completely unrelated. Uh, I had to do some work there. Normally, BBC Transmission, as it was then, didn't really like the studio engineers being in there on their patch, but I had to go up there. It was uh, items connected with equipment that we needed for Monday morning. So I get into this big transmitter hall, press the button to say I'm there, and uh, one man working and all the safety things in place. And I see all these lines, all these all these circuits that says DF, DF, DF. And I knew that those lines were also going to my radio station, which was in Cambridge, but also all of the other regional stations in the other counties surrounding Cambridge. Clearly, they're all going through to this uh, transmitter site. So that is how my um, interest uh, was piqued in it. And then after that, I just really built up, built on it from what I no longer work for the BBC now. I did 10 years with it. Um, and I've really then used my BBC experience to um, I've interviewed people about the uh, about the service, spoken to people who, for instance, I've worked with a person for two years in one office who I didn't know was uh, was part of the uh, wartime broadcasting service. He would have been one of the, the the journalists who would have gone into the bunkers, and he just did not say a thing about it. And from that, it's just ballooned, or use a pun, mushroomed into um, whole aspects of whether it's the the vetting that the BBC staff went through, the various bunkers that the studios are in, the whole Wood Norton bunker as well, and of course the whole transmission network that would have been used um, in the event uh, of of, of a conflict and a a nuclear conflict. Fascinating, fascinating. And I can understand your interest being piqued by uh, (laughs) all of that hush-hush stuff going on so let's let's dig into this because i would so you as you'll be familiar with uh, the episodes we we like to get into the uh, the weeds and the and the detail but when did the wtbs start now the bbc realized it could well be in the 1930s part of the conflict and therefore called on to, to do its bit and so uh, in 1939, uh, just in the early months of 1939, it applied for planning permission to build a large bunker behind Broadcasting House um, the, in the event of Broadcasting House being damaged. Indeed, it was bombed uh, twice during the Blitz. Uh, broadcasting could carry on there. Um, it was completed by 1942, which was after the uh, after the Blitz had largely ended and was never used uh, as a broadcasting facility. Uh, but it still existed there. And indeed, when I worked at Broadcasting House, the place still existed. It was known as the Stronghold, uh, and it was just a storeroom by then. Uh, we had a good old nosy around there on night shifts, but uh, by then it was it had been decommissioned. But the BBC also realised in the 1930s that although it was saved from bombs, um, if the country was invaded, London was, was overrun, having a, a stronghold was not going to help you. So it decided to purchase a stately home in Evesham, Wood Norton Hall, um, south of Birmingham, where it would have a uh, basically a standby broadcasting house. It could uh, it could broadcast from that location. It was well away from the from Kent and 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 the East Anglian coast, which was likely to see the first of the invasion. 
and it was conveniently lo- located near the uh, BBC's main transmitter sites of Droit, which just south of Birmingham, and Daventry in uh, Northampton. Um, so the BBC had these two places, and that is really um, how it got through World War II. So calm happens in 1945. We get this period of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of stability, shall we say, and come 1948 or the late 40s, the Cold War starts, and therefore the government planning uh, uh, for the event of a nuclear conflict. Very much as I know many of your listeners are aware, uh, are aware from other conversations you had, was very much based on uh, sort of similar uh, attacks that would have happened on Nagasaki or Hiroshima. And from that uh, contingency that the government put in place, the BBC uh, generated its own um, war book, uh, the BBC war book, uh, which would have been a uh, broadcasting contingency in the event of an attack similar to that as on a city, a single city attack uh, that would have happened similar to Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, after that, things obviously moved on. Uh, in terms of the H-bomb and that uh, uh, um, really changed a lot of thinking in civil defence thinking and of course the uh, the BBC had to adapt as well. The initial plans was that the, the stronghold bunker in Broadcasting House which structural engineers have said would have withstood a 20 megaton ton bomb landing on uh, or bl- uh, exploding over London it would have withstood that. I mean for instance the, the ceiling was nearly 9 feet thick um, I mean, when, when I was uh, at Broadcasting House in 2008 working on a contract, they were demolishing this bunker because this is where the new new Broadcasting House now sits. So if you see on the, the opening credits of BBC News, the big square building um, uh, behind the original Broadcasting House, well, underneath that was where the bunker was. And they had to demolish it using explosives to get the thing out of the ground. So they would have broadcast from there um, in in the the initial uh, instances. um, And it would have been two high power medium wave transmitters that would have covered most of the country. That they would have uh, put a 24 hour service out, a single service, because by then the BBC was generating three national radio services. It would have folded down to one single uh, national service. And then they would have had a standby facility at uh, Wood Norton to continue this service. Um, the With so many things about civil defence and, and this period, you do get the sort of British humour or the British sort of make and men, shall we say, chewing gum and string come into this because a lot of the programming, the 24-hour service, wasn't just going to be announcements about uh, where fallout might be or where nuclear explosions had happened or where how help was going to come to the survivors. The BBC also planned to put um, light entertainment, religious broadcasting and classical music out as kind of morale boosting uh, as well. Um, but it was rapidly realised that and this is the 1950s where this is pre-transistor radio uh, the chances of the listener being able to hear all of this on their perhaps their large wooden pie radio, valve pie radio that needed the mains, um, was uh, nigh on impossible. And apart from that, the extra resources and the strain on the broadcasting um, infrastructure to create a 24-hour service. So things morphed through in the uh, into the 1960s, um, and it was was very much in line with the. the the, the British government's uh, civil defence policy of breaking up central government and moving it out to uh, various bunkers, various defence regions, as, as many of their uh, uh, Cold War conversation listeners know about the, the, the 10 or 11 regions uh, that the UK split up into for, for, for de- defence purposes. Each of those had one or two central bunkers, and uh, within each of those bunkers was going to be uh, a WTBS studio. Um, they were all networked together to a series of 54 um, low-powered transmitters, um, the medium wave transmitters spread across the, uh, the whole of the UK and Northern Ireland. Um, so the 1960s happens, and then um, things really ramp up in the, in the, in the late to the mid-60s when the BBC realised that with all of these diverse bunkers, it would still have a problem in trying to maintain a central service from Wood Norton. And this is where a bunker comes in at Wood Norton. That in, which it, should we say, the late sixties, planning permission was given for this bunker, um, and by 1974 it was completed. The crazy thing is that um, it did attract a lot of attention because uh, it was built just behind the stately home at Wood Norton, 
and as a cover they said that it was a swimming pool that was going to, was being built which then launched its own can of worms or opened its own can of worms in that the local paper got wind of this and launched a campaign to say can the local residents of Evesham and surrounding villages then use that swimming pool uh, when the BBC people aren't using it so they rather kind of shot themselves in the foot with that cover story but the bunker was created now in all my research of the uh, of the BBC WTBS, the bunker is the one area you have to be careful with because it is still an active facility um, in the UK's emergency broadcasting. And so they're very much blurring elements of to when the BBC wartime broadcasting service finished in 1992 and its current state that it's being used now. It's no great secret that it's there. Ask the 10 or 11 or 12,000 uh, engineers and, 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 and t- uh, technical operators from the BBC who have passed through engineering uh, and training department at, in, in Wood Norton. They'll all tell you about the bunker. But there is a lot of um, uh, hearsay and myths go on about, the, uh, uh, about it. Some people say it's 10 stories deep. Well, I can assure you it isn't. This is the BBC. They don't spend money like that. And also it will probably be bigger than some of the rotor bunkers, the, the regional seats of government bunkers that uh, uh, were used um, in those uh, civil defence regions around the UK. Um, I know that for a fact because I've got the actual building quants that, that, that went into its construction and there's nowhere near the amount of concrete was poured into that ground as even than a, a, a rotor bunker. But it, what it did become was the BBC's emergency broadcasting uh, facility for all uh, events, not just uh, a nuclear attack, but it was the hub of the wartime broadcasting service. The bunker itself is called Protective Accommodation Wood Norton uh, rather than Protected Area and this uh, has turned up in some of the uh, newspaper articles about it and I believe it's probably journalistic mischief because they try and relate it to like Area 51 in America as though the BBC's got kind of um, uh, cryogenically frozen Daleks down there or something like that and give it this sort of air of mystery. But it is the BBC's emergency broadcasting facility and was the hub of the WTBS. Um, from uh, Wood Norton, there were something like 200 post office or GPO, later uh, British Telecom telephone lines, went in and out of the place, linking uh, a network of uh, transmitters, the R- RSG Bunker Studios, um, lines down to Cosham or Burlington, links to broadcasting house of course not just over copper because obviously they were susceptible to uh, to damage from a nuclear explosion but also other microwave links that could be linked to the other transmitter networks and uh, and the bunkers uh, around the country how would it have been launched what what would have happened as far as the existing tv and and radio stations there's a lot of hearsay around it that everything's based on the four minute warning but in any scenario there's always a a countdown to events we saw that uh, with uh, uh, in the UK face lockdown it didn't just happen we're not just going into lockdown uh, government civil defence planning is based on five days notice which is exactly what happened when we had lockdown we had a, the Prime Minister at the time Boris Johnson announced on Sunday evening we were going into lockdown and Thursday we went into lockdown. There would have been a period of notice given to uh, the BBC. The BBC themselves said they wanted uh, two weeks, 14 days to uh, set the WTBS up and by that I mean although the technical infrastructure was already in place uh, it was to get the staff uh, primed uh, just as those people who would have gone to the RSG um, uh, bunkers to staff those the civil servants would have been given that notice to go there the BBC staff would have been uh, had to have that notice and then a further 48 hours from offices or the head of uh, the Prime Minister's office giving notice to the BBC to launch the WTBS Within that destabilisation period and that countdown to, to it, uh, the, the policy was very much not to shock the, uh, the British public. They would do that by gradually folding the number of services available down. So I said at the time during, during this period, the BBC put uh, sometimes three, later four 
national radio services out and two television national television networks they would have been folding those down perhaps say to one television network folding it down to one um uh, radio service this is also to de-staff the bbc as well to to um, make sure that they could still uh, run the services adequate adequately um they then would have been starting a period once the uh, they had the go ahead to launch the WTBS from uh, from the government. There would have been dramatic changes on what you saw on television and heard on the radio services. Um, the first thing is that the television services would have gone over to um, the civil defence films. The most obvious one for the 1980s would have been Protect and Survive. That basically would have been put on continuous loop. The BBC also, um, for those people listening outside the UK, uh, there are two main broadcasting bodies in the in the UK, the BBC and uh, ITV, Independent Television and Independent Radio. As we're talking a period in the 1980s. Independent television and radio was governed by an organisation called the Independent Broadcasting Authority, and they would have handed over control of the TV and radio transmitters that they offered to their independent television and radio operators. They all would have gone over to the control of the BBC. So basically, uh, the BBC's one service and probably ITV's one service would have been showing Protect and Survive on continuous loop, almost. And the radio services would have been... um, playing a similar thing um, in terms of audio version of uh, 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 Protect and Survive. But the FM, the HF services and the medium wave services would have um, had information about how to tune that radio and what frequency uh, you should tune into for your area. And what that would consist of would have been, uh, let me see, I've just got to do the sums now. It was a half hour broadcast and it was a 20 minute tape and a 10 minute read, uh, a live read by the announcer at the BBC. And uh, during that live 10 minute read, the tape was rewound and played again. And the tape had all of the tuning frequencies for every area, very much like uh, any British listener might well know the uh, the shipping forecast, where it lists all the different areas around the country, all the different uh, sea areas around around the island of, of the UK. It would list them area by area and what frequency you needed to tune to. And this would be repeated on a loop over and over again, um, probably for, I would say, probably a day, maybe two days. Um, and then... Uh, they go into the actual launch of the WTBS. And that would be known as um, A Hour, where they were saying, tune your radios to this, go to your um, uh, uh, protection, hopefully you follow Protect and Survive. And that would last for half an hour. And strangely enough, although it was A A Hour, it only lasted 30 minutes. Then they would go into, on the radio services, the S Hour, and this was known as switching, where they would go to half an hour of silence. And during that time, all of the engineers at the protected accommodation transmitter sites, these 54 transmitter sites around the UK, would retune and set up their transmitter to take the uh, WTBS service. Um, And after that, they go into an hour, and that will be the launch of the uh, the WTBS, giving announcements, uh, continuous announcements or a timetable sometimes if, if if things got very very tight to say we are going off air now we will be back at say eight o'clock at night we'll be back at 10 o'clock at night and and they will continue at perhaps two to four hour intervals so that's just medium wave and fm radio long wave that would have shut down during an hour one of the myths flying around is that um the nuclear submarine commanders one of the tests that they might do to see if the uh, the UK had been devastated by nuclear Armageddon was to surface and see if they could hear 198 long wave. It goes over pretty much at night time over most of the country. And if they couldn't hear it, one of the things is they, they, they would use that as an indication that the U- UK had been devastated and therefore they'd submerge, get to their launch place and press their red button. It's an entire myth because in the documents uh, in the BBC War Book explicitly states that 198 Long Wave will shut down at end hour. The idea behind that was twofold. Firstly, it's a long wave transmitter and it takes a hell of a lot of energy to run uh, during a, a, a nuclear strike. Secondly, it was to reduce confusion to the listener where you just have one frequency to listen to, not, not several other services that you're tuned around to on your radio. And then finally, television. 
television would have had uh, a hour. It would have then said, this service is closing down in an hour's time, perhaps putting out Protect and Survive, perhaps putting out pre-recorded announcements from the Queen. Uh, I don't entirely know, but during that during that hour, it would have uh, had announcements to say that the service is shutting down. And at N hour, when the WTBS launched, television would have gone, would have shut down, gone to black. There was no plans to run anything other than a radio service during this emergency period for the simple reason that television is so um, uh, technically complicated and it uses a lot of energy that just wasn't on the uh, on the agenda. So we would all fold down to one service, the WTBS, covering the whole of the UK. The activation order for the wartime broadcasting service, how was that communicated? You talked about the, the red phone. Does that ring and they say, right, we're on? It would have been. Uh, there are various code words, and if you don't mind, I'm not going to give them away. There is, If you do a search on it, you can find one or two, but they did change uh, during the... Uh, uh, during the life of the WTBS, there are various code words that would have come from Whitehall, the government um, or uh, uh, government administrative offices, and they would have most likely come through on the red phone, which sat on the technical operators operation manager's desk. It didn't go to things like the head of the BBC, the director general. It didn't go to anybody like that. It went to the technical operation manager, who is responsible for the technical output all of the output of the BBC, or, or is, there's two of them uh, there were at the time. Uh, code words would have been given out to uh, set up the launch period of the, uh, um, the WTBS and being that holding pattern, and then it might have rung again, as well as the setup of the WTBS for all the staff to go to the, uh, the their various stations. Uh, the BBC would have set up a war room, a broadcasting house, which is was basically to do the administration of of, of uh, the organisation of of the service. So therefore, uh, the actual sort of go code to say let's go into uh, a hour uh, would have come through as another code word from Whitehall. When that phone rang, um, the first thing the uh, technical operations manager is supposed to do is get the war book, the, the BBC's instructions for the for emergency broadcasting out of the safe. And indeed, they still have safes uh, holding emergency uh, uh, broadcasting instructions now. I know that for a fact because I, I know, still know some of the, as they're called, duty operations managers at the BBC now who are the, 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 the sort of current equivalent. Again, here in the sort of interviewing some of the BBC staff who were intimately connected with the WTBS during that period, you do you do hear some of the stories. And um, was one um, engineer I spoke to who was tasked with testing those lines, that, that red phone line, and they decided to ring it from Whitehall, and it didn't work. <laughs> and they reckoned it had never been wired up correctly, so it had been installed, allegedly commissioned, and didn't actually work. Um, and we also used to joke about what the, the Tom would do when I, when I worked in control rooms, like, what will you do if that phone actually rings? And the usual thing would be, you know, brown trouser moment, really, uh, because it's all suddenly going to get horribly, horribly real. The BBC staff that were going to be involved in WTBS, they, they knew their roles in advance, did they? They did. In the early days, they were assigned. Uh, later on, late 60s, they were um, invited. Um, the staffing would have come from for the RSGs for, from the, the adjacent local radio station. And the idea was that the head of news, perhaps the station manager, and also the chief engineer, because each bunker was uh, going to have two BBC journalistic staff, broadcasting staff, had one engineer who would be under the control of the government central office of information representatives also in the bunker who would basically tell them what to broadcast. Uh, they'd all be drawn from those, station, the, those stations. Then there was Wood Norton itself. Uh, there was about 90 staff that were scheduled to go there in that 14-day startup period. The, those 90 staff slated to go to Wood Norton, the majority would be from London. They were told to assemble at a, an anonymous site in West London where a coach would have picked them up and uh, taken them to uh, Wood Norton. Um, and then uh, it's the same with the transmitter sites. Each of the 54 transmitter sites would have had two, in, two potentially three engineers there. 
Uh, those transmitter sites are, were known as protected accommodation. There were fallout protection. There was no blast protection. If you think, not a lot of point being protected from blast if your uh, transmitter mast falls down. So there were only fallout protection. But they would have had to go there. And some of the larger transmitter sites had things called switching centers as well to, to actually route all the audio around. Uh, so it was a getting on for about 280 to 300 staff would have been needed to run uh, BBC staff to, to run the WTBS. But, and we've touched on this, and uh, there's always this question when, you know, the siren wails, would you have actually gone um, uh, into that bunker? Because you were, it was you, it was no family, there was no family allowed. Would you have actually um, done your duty when uh, you knew that your family were kind of topside and, and open to fallout radiation and blast? So quite honestly, they, they over-egged it. They, they top-loaded it, really. That's nine people, so they bank on some might not turn up. Some maybe couldn't turn up, um, you know, maybe met with an accident or just traffic or whatever. So they would have enough people to man each of the bunkers. What isn't known is if all of, say, all nine of those people, the, the only three that were needed, all turned up. The other six, mind you, just had, sorry, the door is literally being slammed in your face as we, as we close the bunker. They would have said all had a letter that would have invited them to um, uh, be considered um, f for working on the WTBS and to keep it secret. And, and after that, during the 14-day period, run-up period, they would have then received another letter to say, you are required to muster West London site or go to this particular transmitter site. The crazy thing is, as well, another, another uh, very sort of strange, only British thing, I think, would happen is that they were all allowed to have a cash advance of £100, 30, which, 30 pounds of which was pocket money, to spend on, I don't know, was there a tuck shop in one in these bunkers? I never, I never, I never knew that. Um, and a further seventy pounds that could be given to their family uh, to, to the fact that they were going to be away working at some uh, secret site. Uh, they were told to bring their own entertainment, books, cards, that kind of thing, and a, and a change of clothes and travel light. Uh, and it was usually uh, men. Uh, there were a few women involved in it, uh, the uh, anomaly at Sherwood Norton. Um, strangely enough, the whole list was drawn up by the um, head of BBC personnel. Uh, and they were on the list to go into the bunker of Wood Norton. There were people such as head of uh, religious broadcasting um, there and also uh, a certain number of people who worked for the BBC monitoring service, which is the service that listens to uh, foreign radio stations to, to gather news and in, uh, uh, what might be going on in those countries. The, the bunker Wood Norton was also equipped with listening facilities to listen to perhaps, you know, hello, is there anybody out there and, and any other radio stations in Europe that might still be broadcasting? I guess these people would have had to sign the Official Secrets Act, which is going to be, I would have thought as a journalist, that would be quite challenging. See, see I, I don't. I don't know. My research, my research is ongoing, and it's and that level. In speaking to BBC staff who were uh, uh, connected with the WTBS, and also I should have mentioned these people, they were they were invited. They were actually vetted. They were positively vetted, although they didn't know it, uh, by uh, a person called uh, Brigadier Ronnie Stonham in the nineteen seventies, eighties. Uh, this was. Uh, the Observer newspaper, a news, national newspaper title in the UK, uh, broke the story that BBC staff were being vetted um, before being allowed on the air f for their sort of political affiliations, whether that was either left wing or, or right wing and whether they were the right staff. And that spilled over into um, retired Brigadier Stonham's role of uh, vetting those people who would run the WTBS. And they, uh, on their staff files, would have received a thing called the Christmas tree. It was actually a little upward-facing uh, arrow, uh, which indicated refer up to uh, line management for promotion or doing these specialist roles. It wasn't actually a Christmas tree shape. But I do know some people, personally, I knew somebody who worked in the control room of Broadcasting House wore a CND badge and was... Uh, um, barred from working on uh, emergency broadcasting services for that reason. And uh, I have spoken to other BBC staff members who said uh, they, they, whether they were card carrying members of the Labour Party or the British Communist Party, um, were um, prevented from sort of being in the know. 
Now, whether those people actually sign the Official Secrets Act, I don't know. Prior to me joining the BBC, I um, I worked on Br- um, Britain's uh, nuclear deterrent. Uh, I hated it, actually. I just, I just did it for a couple of years only to do a, a technical course, which would allow me to get into the BBC. And I well remember as, a, as my first day as a 19-year-old signing a blue form, and uh, the uh, and when asked the person, personnel what it was, she said, that's the Official Secrets Act. I mean, we can shoot you in those times of war. So as a 19-year-old in your first day at work, that kind of sticks with you. Um, yeah, that's quite an induction, that, isn't it? Just a bit, just a bit. Um, and uh, frankly, I'd be a rubbish spy anyway because I couldn't even tell you a clue what I was doing in those two years there. Um, but whether the BBC staff connected with emergency broadcast signed that, I don't know. As you, because as you rightly point out, um, journalistic staff, and especially with the BBC wanting its uh, uh, independence, uh, would they have signed it willingly? So that's something still I, we, I, I need to find out. You see, there's so many aspects of the... The, of the WTBS, yes, there's the broad brush strokes of the technical infrastructure, uh, what would have been broadcast, uh, who would have been on the broadcasting, but that's that minutiae that really uh, really adds to the whole story. Yeah, I love a bit of minutiae. Um, <laughs> did they do many exercises to just test the whole thing out? Oh, yeah, they definitely had uh, regular exercises, and there was also resistance from BBC staff um, to, to doing these. Uh, the head of television, Hugh Weldon, in the 1960s wanted nothing to do with emergency broadcasting because he felt it was utterly pointless to, to do anything like this. But yes, the BBC regularly conduct um, uh, uh, training scenarios for uh, um, obit rehearsals, as we call them, obituary rehearsals. Um, for instance, you know, last year the Queen died. They they had, I, even in my day when I was uh, on the BBC in the late 1980s through to the 1990s, they were killing the Queen off and the, and the Queen Mother and, and doing rehearsals for, for, for that announcement. I just think this stuff's um, just off the hoof. And so I would imagine, yes, they were doing regular um tests when i say regular i wouldn't say sort of monthly but probably government mandated there have been that there were exercises uh, anyway that the government ran uh, for a uh, nuclear attack you know they ran them at sort of regular intervals and I imagine the bbc would have been part of that because as you know yeah the hack green bunker is the nearest one for me and they have quite a well equipped studio there Actually, when all that equipment actually came from Culty Bragham Bunker, um, when when Culty Bragham was uh, in Scotland was uh, decommissioned, uh, but yes, that equipment came from uh, um, Culty Bragham. But if you go to the Hat Green Bunker, it is quite a good um, setup, quite an indication of what uh, a WTBS studio would have looked like in its latter stages. All of them were equipped to a similar standard, whether they all had the same equipment in, because it was a rolling program of, of, of upgrading. But the essence behind it was simplicity. And the other thing was, in the latter stages, as I've already touched on, it would have been local radio staff who would staff the bunkers, and they're used to a certain level of equipment, um, uh, really sort of uh, do it yourself, p- p- pressing the buttons themselves, opening the faders and speaking into the microphone. Whereas a lot of network national radio broadcasters are to sit in a studio and talk and have somebody else do all the controlling for them. And the other thing, of course, is it has to be simple. So it works because although they had all this elaborate setup to link all the transmitters or, or for Wood Norton to all the bunkers and all the bunkers to the transmitters so the, the local uh, bunkers could opt in to, 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 to jump into their local transmitter and, and interrupt the national feed from Wood Norton, that lot's all going to be very much prone to running on diesel generators, whether some of the lines still exist and all the switching centers and transmitter sites still exist after a nuclear attack. So simplicity was the key. I've got a couple of photos of me um, pretending to broadcast from the desk in the uh, in the studio there, and I've got this mock BBC armband that they gave me to uh, put on as well. So... Uh, I'm trying to look as though I'm exuding gravitas there, but perhaps not carrying it off. What you would have heard on the WTPS was was very formulaic. Uh, The idea is that there has to be concise information put over. Um, So a lot of the announcements were literally just cut and paste. 
there will be a working party or fallout is expected or food distribution will happen and then it was fill in the blank of that area and that is what the BBC staff would have read out as I said you they were under the control of the Central Office of Information which is the, the, the government's uh, media mouthpiece and there would have been a group I mean, there was three BBC staff in each of these bunkers. There was something like 10 government uh, uh, information officers to, to, to relay the information. So they would have been working to them. Um, there was uh, there were national material that would have come out of, um, uh, of Wood Norton. By then, by the 1960s, the BBC had dropped the idea of the comedy and the, uh, and, and the religious and the or- broadcasting and the, or- and, the, and the orchestras playing. And it was very much confined to announcements. Um, there is, there were two announcements actually recorded by the late Peter Donaldson, who was the BBC's chief announcer. Um, the first one is uh, has been destroyed, to my knowledge. It no longer exists um, for good reason, because if it fell into the wrong hands, it could create panic. And it basically says this country is about to be attacked by nuclear weapons. What well, does exist, albeit not in full, uh, in, in, in its full in, uh, entirety, um, is this country has been attacked. Uh, if you wish to search for it on the net, you can find it. It's a 54 second recording. The full script runs to about two and a half minute read. Yeah, I've listened to the Peter Donaldson announcement, and it's quite eerie because he's a very familiar voice to anybody who's listened to Radio 4 during that period and to hear him announce what is the grimmest news that the UK could ever face. This is the wartime broadcasting service. This country has been attacked with nuclear weapons. Communications have been severely disrupted and the number of casualties and the extent of the damage are not yet known. We shall bring you further information as soon as possible. Meanwhile, stay tuned to this wavelength, stay calm, and stay in your own house. Remember, there's nothing to be gained by trying to get away. By leaving your homes, you could be exposing yourselves to greater danger. If you leave, you may find yourselves without food, without water, without accommodation, and without protection. We shall be on the air every hour on the hour. Stay tuned to this wavelength, but switch your radios off now to save your batteries. That is the end of this broadcast. Was he ever interviewed to ask what it was like recording that? He was, because that's not just the only thing he recorded. He did, I said, he recorded the one this country is uh, ha- will be attacked and this emergency announcement. Um, I gather he and the uh, producer in the studio, when they recorded these things, um, after finishing, they uh, both felt very depressed. So they both went down the pub and uh, had a drink. Um, and the recordings obviously were then uh, taken away and, and, and stored where they were, possibly in the same safe of the technical operations manager, uh, because uh, along with the war book, because there would have been a separate studio down in Broadcasting House who would have made those announcements when the WTBS was launched from Broadcasting House before transferring up to in that 14 day period. Uh, there were also other alerts that were recorded on various cassettes and real to tapes that would have been um, uh, sent to the various RSG bunkers around the country. D- did you say that there was a pre-recorded message from the Queen as well? There is certainly a script from the Queen. There's a f- in- initial one to say there's there's conflict going on, and uh, I think it mentions like her son Andrew is currently fighting with his his unit. Um, and this would have been voiced. I very much doubt if that would have been read live. Uh, we all know about the uh, uh, the contingency plans um, to move the royal family out of of, of London, um, whether that was to Canada or floating around on Britannia or one of the nuclear ferries or something, whatever, in the Highlands. But I very much, for, for instance, there wouldn't have been any BBC broadcasting. I've never found any plans that they would have done any broadcasting from any of the nuclear ferries or Britannia. Uh, they just didn't have that uh, infrastructure uh, to get the signal back from across the water. So whether they would have it would have been a live or a pre-recorded one, and it would have been if it would have been pre-recorded, it would have been done in, in advance, much like the I would imagine, much like the wishes letter that each prime minister writes to the captains of the nuclear submarines when they take when the, when they take office. 
um, as to what they should do, it will probably be one that would have been recorded and refreshed over time to say, you know, we're all thinking of you and, and, and chin up Britain, we're going to, to pull through with this. All cheerful stuff then. Definitely. I mean, it really is. It would have been, in some for some people, a lot of people, I would imagine, the last voice you'd ever heard. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. This project wouldn't exist without our generous financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwallconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.